All right, welcome back to the House Committee on Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. We are reconvening our meeting. Thank you all. <laughs> Going to uh, pivot back toward uh, to Chris Cochran and Jake, Jacob Hemerick to wrap up their presentation. Um, do you guys, I mean, I, I'm flexible. If you want me to wrap it up or I can let these folks go, I mean, I'm, I can make my point at any time. It's already kind of non sequitur. Anyway, it is. So. Um, okay, sure. Why don't we pivot to uh, Jen Holler? Welcome. Dynamic today. And maybe uh, maybe Lizzie can pull up the presentation I sent. So good morning. My name is uh, Jen Holler. I'm the policy director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And it's been some time before I've been before your committee. So just by um, way of background, my um, uh, my background is in public administration. My experience is in uh, housing, um, community development, and conservation at the um, federal, state, and local levels. Um, I serve as the policy director for DHCB. I work across the um, across the organization on both the housing and conservation sides. And then um, before I came to DHCB, about Almost seven years ago, I served in the Shumwood administration and handled housing issues for um, the governor at the Department of Housing and Community Development and got to work with Chris. Um, so what I'd like to do today, I think, is to I'll move through pretty quickly, but um, to um, first, well, kind of three main things, and that is um, to provide some background, uh, speak a little bit to 226 at the very end, but at the very high level, uh, to provide some background on housing work that the state is supporting. VHCB is the organization through which the state provides funding for housing development. So talk about how that's going, where it's going, and what policies are around that. Sarah <laughs> asked me to talk a little bit about how much housing VHCB has done over time and affordability levels, I'll touch on that. Um, but before I dive into any of that, I want to say thank you. So thank you very much to this committee for your incredibly supportive letter to the House Appropriations Committee. Um, it really made a difference in their deliberations and um, BHCB received an increase in our base funding um, coming through the House, which puts us um, in a much better position. Our base hadn't changed or gone up in many years. Um, we've been fortunate, as you know, to have been asked to handle a lot of federal housing money, um, but our conservation numbers have been pretty flat for a long time. So thank you for that support. Thank you for the work that your committee's doing. It's been really exciting to see conservation be a bigger part of the state house discussion this year um, and to see um, the UVA bill and um, H606 moving along their way. So I uh, wanted to, to all that. Um, and let's see. So this actually, so there's housing happening all over the state and it happened um, through the pandemic. Construction did um, continue and, um, and we are continuing to review lots of applications for new housing. There's a tremendous need uh, and that's a lot of what you heard from Seth's excellent presentation. Um, and I think what S226 really talks about is like, we know there's gonna be pressure for housing development um, and what 226 does, I think, is sets the table for where we want that development to go. And um, this, this is just an example of something we funded recently, and there's some existing housing. Now, this is in West Burke. Um, so we work in all kinds of communities. There's some existing housing. It'll get rehabbed, and more units will be added. So we can go to the next slide. So... Um, we always ground our, our testimony in our, in our statutory purpose. It's housing and conservation, really um, preserving the state's historic um, <coughs> settlement patterns. What you see here is uh, um, just north of Bennington and Shaftesbury. The body of water at the top is Lake Perrin. Over time, BHCB has been able to support the Robert Frost House there with the historic preservation grant, um, some walking trails, a few years ago, uh, new housing development was created there called Lake Parent Housing, new affordable um, housing, um, and the lake itself, the land around the lake itself has been conserved. So it's a little bit of everything we do there. And I raise this because what VHCB is really about is balancing those two, those two imperatives, the need for housing, but then also to protect our important um, natural areas and um, 
working lands. Okay, next slide. And you've heard from, you heard from Trey and Gus about this uh, recently in the context of H-606. And just to mention, Gus will be um, with you again tomorrow when you take up the issue of ag mitigation. Uh, so over 34 years, this is what we've done in a really um, big picture, not very exciting kind of way because it's just numbers. But the chair was wondering about how much, how much housing we had done, and it's a little over 14,000 units over over that period of line uh, of time. Also working forests, natural areas, recreational areas. Um, we do historic preservation projects um, <coughs> for uh, buildings that are going to be for community use, and then. Um, about 20 years ago, we established a farm and forest viability program, thinking that not only do we need to keep our working lands open, but we need the, we need the, the businesses and the owners um, who take care of that land to be able to remain viable. So we provide technical assistance, business planning, succession planning, and those kinds of services um, help 856 over time. The pictures you see here are just a smattering. Um, the, the one on the top left is in Putney, um, uh, an old church. It's now um, a performing arts center. The middle photo is of a vi farm viability client in Highgate, um, small axle farm. And then um, at the top on the right is uh, Prospect Mountain, uh, which, is, uh, which is a much beloved um, recreational uh, Asset in the community of Woodford, and it's now been conserved and um, living a new uh, a new phase of its life. Okay, we can go to the next next slide. So, um, a major tenet um, of what VHCD does is around permanent affordability. So, when we invest state, when we when you entrust state dollars to us, we invest them in housing and conservation in a way that's going to be protected over time. So, if it's a conservation project. <laughs> conservation easements. If it's, if it's a housing development, it comes with a housing subsidy covenant that requires the rents or the homes to remain affordable in perpetuity. Um, the housing, the 14,000 um, housing units that we've done, some are rental, some are home ownership over time. Like I said, they're all restricted by housing subsidy covenants. The details vary greatly, as you can imagine, we do lots of different types of housing, but generally, those are affordable at 80% of the area median and one third of them of those affordable at a deeper level at 50% of the area median income. Now, recently, a lot of the focus and emphasis has been on creating homes for uh, folks who are coming out of um, homelessness. And so some of them are specifically dedicated to that purpose, some of the apartments. Um, another example of a variation is uh, when the state asked us to use the resources from the housing revenue bond. They said, please use a quarter of it for uh, apartments or homes that are affordable at more of a middle range. So between 80 and 120. So there is variation, but it, uh, generally that's what we look to for affordability in rental housing. In home ownership, um, again, also with housing subsidy covenants, our statute allows us to do that up for households up to 120% of the area median income. More typically, it's at 100, um, and we um, sometimes we provide funding for the construction of new homes, but a lot of what we do is through what we call the shared equity program, where we provide funding to a um, an eligible uh, prospective home buyer. They go buy a home um, with the assistance from us through one of the local housing nonprofits, and in exchange, when they sell that home, they agree to just take 75% of the equity with them and 25 excuse me, it's the reverse. They take 25% of the equity and 75% of that value remains with the home. So each time it, that property sells and they sell it like an average every seven years, um, it remains a little bit more affordable for the next, the next purchaser. A quick question, Jen. How do you, when somebody, at the end of that seven years, when somebody else buys it, how do you ensure that the person buying it fits the criteria? The local housing nonprofit um, is in charge of that basically, okay. and they they help okay. find the next eligible okay. buyer. Okay. And the and then the restrictions are um, in the land records. Okay. And this is a property in um, in Bennington, um, a new neighborhood that was developed down there. It's called Monument View for obvious reasons. You can see the Bennington Monument in the past. <laughs> um, it's a location that was uh, within walking distance of the downtown and a good infill development. Okay, we can go to the next slide. 
I'm just kind of touching on kind of the principles through which we do our, our work. So a little more on home ownership is that we provide funding to create new homes um, and help new owners access <clears throat> home ownership. I talked about the shared equity program. We've done 1,300 um, of those statewide. And as they've turned over or new buyers, they've served about 900 families. Um, and these include 157 homes that were uh, built um, by the new homeowners through the Habitat for Humanity program. Here's a couple examples, one in Rutland um, and then one in East Montpelier. And we can keep going. Um, a little bit more on home ownership because an awful oftentimes we talk about rental housing a lot, but we are doing home ownership. And a point I want to make here, because you've been thinking about environmental justice, is one of the main ways that we can, one of the best ways we can make our communities more welcoming and inclusive is to make sure that there are people who have been historically disadvantaged and make sure that there are affordable homes. So here's a few examples. There's a Manchester Habitat for Humanity home and a woman and her son, um, she works at one of the local businesses, uh, moved in there in Butternut Grove. Um, condominiums in Winooski, the uh, city um, contributed a piece of land and uh, um, the Champlain Housing Trust and uh, Evernorth have developed um, condominiums and their marketing and outreach is going on right now and it's focused at um, BIPOC households in terms of the marketing and outreach. Now these aren't restricted to BIPOC households because that raises all kinds of constitutionality questions but that's the way they decided to try to get at that issue. They wanted to develop homeownership opportunities in Winooski, a really diverse community. And then um, Safford Commons in Woodstock has a little bit of a notorious reputation. The rental housing that was already there was subject to appeal, was caught up in appeals for um, 10 years. Um, eventually the rental housing was built and now um, there are some homeownership units that are being constructed there. So that's, um, so that's exciting. Okay, we can move on. Um, a lot of what we do is to renovate old buildings. Here's a couple examples, and these are with emphasis on those experiencing homelessness. One's an old school in Rutland, um, and one is a historic building in a neighborhood in Bennington. Um, and those are either completed or um, will be before too long. We can keep going. And I'm just trying to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that VHCB or the state's doing through VHCB. A lot of emphasis um, on revitalizing downtowns and village centers. I mean, uh, smart growth and putting things in the heart of our communities is very much a part of our consideration whenever we review a project application. And you can see a smattering of what we've done here. A couple in small places like Guilford and Lindenville um, and some in sort of moderate size. Marlboro, <laughs> Montpelier, that's the French block downtown. You've heard about that when it was vacant for 75 years. and then. Um, now there are two floors of apartments on the top um, in St. Albans. Um, that community has showed incredible leadership and, and welcoming um, development <laughs> downtown and there's a public private partnership there, but we can move on. I think it may be Chris and Jacob have heard this before. What do you guys think? <laughs> They're both on their phones. <laughs> We do new construction. This is in um, smart growth area. Uh, here's an example of one that we just um, like closed, closed in terms of like sealing the real estate deal and construction will begin soon. Stewart Avenue in Colchester and it's in a, um, it's in a growth center um, and it would qualify as a priority housing project. It's part of a larger private development which will have more than 200 market rate apartments and condominiums, retail, commercial space, restaurants and a daycare center nearby. Okay, next slide, please. Wait, how, how does, excuse me, but the market rate, how does that relate to affordability? Well, market rate is something that's unrestricted. So it would be a, an apartment that could be rented at whatever the market will support. Okay, so it's primarily so just addressing housing needs, not necessarily affordable. Exactly, general housing needs and not specifically what we would call affordable housing. So smart growth, as I mentioned, is, is part of our DNA, VHCB's DNA, and um, um, one way you can think about that is through, uh, the Vermont Natural Resources Council does a smart growth sort of report card or progress report uh, periodically. Uh, one came out not too long ago and they looked at um, investments by a bunch of different entities from FY 2013 to 2019 
including the Housing and Conservation Boards. And what they found was that 90% of everything we funded was um, in smart growth locations. They said about 9% of what we funded um, would qualify as being in a straw location and then unknown is 1%. Um, but I think, so we're pretty proud of that. I think the thing to really note is that all the investments, 100% of the investments in any new housing were in smart growth locations. So sometimes and often we will provide funding for the upgrade of a mobile home park or you know mobile home community or some other existing housing um, that may not be in a smart growth location. And that's what you would find in the, um, that's what comprises the 9%. Okay, we can go on. So to get to some of the current funding, you know, we're working with our usual VHCB, <laughs> typical state funding, but we're also doing a lot of work right now deploying the American Rescue Plan Act housing resources that the legislature um, has allocated to us. And there are lots of different um, layers to that in terms of how we could use that funding. And at the very top layer is the U.S. Department of Treasury's final rule and associated guidance. It's like this thick. So... That's, that's what really establishes how that money can be used. Um, the next layer down is at the state level and the state appropriated the funds to us specifically in last year's budget to provide housing and increase shelter capacity with priority for those who are um, living in motels, but then also to create housing in um, mixed income settings. And then at the VHCB level, we have additionally adopted guidelines and procedures for what kinds of projects are eligible for that funding and what our priorities are going to be when we get a batch of applications. And we have $62 million in applications that our staff are reviewing right now, 26 different projects, about 400, um, 400 to 600 new um, homes. And these, these are additional requirements that we have added onto that to reflect our state policies. So those include permanent affordability, and then also prioritizing smart growth locations. So um, that's a lot of the work that we're doing right now. Okay, the next slide. And here's what's been funded so far with both the ARPA funding and uh, some of the state supplemental. There was some one-time general funds that the state directed to us to get at that homelessness issue. People were so, and still are so concerned about the people in motels. Um, and so there was some additional funding for that. But here are the results so far. Some of these are completed, some are um, still rounding up other funding sources, and some are um, uh, and some are in construction, but 431 rental units, more than half of those for households experiencing homelessness, recovery housing, transitional units. And we've done some other things too. So home accessibility projects, a big grant to the Vermont Center for Independent Living. They do home access projects to help people with disabilities or um, to be able to stay on their homes. Mobile well, home communities, including infrastructure improvements. Um, and then a farm worker housing rehab loan program is something that's new and it's right at the intersection of our housing and conservation mission. Um, so we're excited to be rolling that out. And anyway, I mentioned that um, 62 million applications we're reviewing right now and we'll make recommendations to our board in May and June. Okay, the next slide. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to talk about priority housing projects a little bit because it's a lot of what's in the bill. So I included a couple, a few data points here that I think might be um, helpful. And so essentially, as you've heard, Ellen, and as you well know, Act 250 includes a definition of a priority housing project. And if a project meets that definition, um, then it uh, is not considered, it doesn't meet the definition of a development. It's not considered a development for the purpose of Act 250 and does not need to go through the Act 250 process. So in our view, um, those PHP provisions in Act 250 are really important. Um, and these are the reasons why from our perspective. And that is that um, government, federal, local will never be able to fund the creation of enough housing to satisfy our housing needs. So we need to do what we need to do and everything we can, to, but we also need the private market and private developers, obviously, to be able to develop too. And one of the, re, one of the things that um, the PHP definition does is that it 
incent private developers to include affordable housing in their developments. That really works. And that's been a great thing because if they include 20% of their units affordable at 80% and they're in certain areas, they meet that definition and don't have to go through Act 250. Um, PH, that's a pretty big incentive if a developer, and you've heard that, doesn't need to go through Act 250. So it really helps direct development to those areas where we really want it to be. We want it to be in, in smart growth areas, designated areas. Um, and it really does have that effect. Uh, it reduces the cost and time to develop projects. There's an extra word in there, in that can go out. Um, and as Seth explained, projects are, we need them to come online quickly and they're also getting increasingly expensive. So that's a good thing. And then um, there are those who have concerns in communities about bringing affordable housing in and who might live there. And that's an unfortunate reality. Um, but if a project does, goes, can go through the local zoning process, but not have to also go through Act 250, it eliminates um, a point at which people can raise objections. Um, and um, at this point, I think, I think what I, and we, from VHCB's perspective, because we always look at it from both sides, the housing and conservation, that that's an appropriate balance, that these priority housing projects are really made, or that avenue um, are available only in those places where doing so doesn't compromise um, some other conservation value, that, or there's some other process that's already in place at the local level, or they've gone through the designated, um, gone through getting a state designation. So the, the things that we would all be concerned about in terms of location have, and design have been addressed somewhere else. Um, to help put all this in context on the Senate side, the Natural Resources Board provided them with information that said that 21 housing developments in the last five years met the definition of a priority housing project and were therefore exempt from Act 250. Um, I get this question a lot, but uh, 40 of those were developed by nonprofit housing developer and 60% were by private development. So there really are private developers who are trying to meet this definition and including affordable housing in their, in their projects. And then um, in terms of what VHCB has funded so far with the ARPA funds, we funded so far, and we're, like I said, we're reviewing a bunch more, we have funded 17 projects so far. And two of those are mobile home communities, infrastructure improvements, so they don't, you know, that doesn't trigger Act 250. Um, but 15 of them are rental housing developments. Seven of those 15 that we funded are subject to Act 250. And of those seven, five qualify as a priority housing project. So, so the priority housing projects were out of Act 250. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. It's seven of them are subject to Act 250. And of those seven, five will qualify as priority housing projects, but That's priority right. housing projects don't aren't subject to Act 250. Um, I understand. Well, they would otherwise be subject to Act So seven of the 15 would be covered by Act 250, and five of those qualify okay. as priority housing projects, so they don't. Don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I well, um, my question, too, but was a little different um, uh, approach. Of those seven, which uh, our uh, projects are funded, our subjects, seven of those only five qualified as PHP. They qualify when they're developed as such, but when they're not developed with a 20%, they don't qualify. So does this statistic mean five of those that could qualify um, of those seven, five didn't because they didn't want to include? So these are ones that are funded by VHCB and everything we fund because of the funding we provided, they're much more affordable than what a priority housing project requires. So, um, so each of those five, meets the affordability threshold for the priority, meets and exceeds the affordability threshold in the priority housing As project. Developed. 
Yeah, because we require them to do yeah. much more okay. affordability. Um, and of the, so five qualify as PHPs, meanings they're super yep. affordable yep. and they're in the areas where yep. you can qualify as a PHP, like a, yep. you know, a downtown area. Two didn't, they're still in smart growth locations, but they might not be within the boundaries of a, des a designated area. So they didn't qualify for that reason, but they're- Or, very, or were not affordable. developed out in that fashion. Pardon? Or were not built out with 20%. In there. Well, if we funded them, they did. They well, the, the other two, you yeah, did. These are all well, there. The seven are all ones that VHCB is funded, so they all have state or federal funding. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Wait. <laughs> if I, I think it's just the designated areas, as you saw in the map, are very, very constrained to tight areas. Mm -hmm. So there's, and this kind of makes the point of the why we're having this conversation about this bill is we'd like to enlarge those areas because there's a lot of smart growth areas that aren't designated. And if it was easier for communities to designate neighborhoods, I suspect those two that didn't qualify for priority housing projects likely would have. Been able. Yeah, they might have. Yeah, thank you. I could look thank at that. You. So Lizzie, I think if there are no more questions, we could go on to the next slide. Yep, Chief. There it is. Okay, so and not to get into the weeds of um, S226, um, but, um, just to speak generally to the land use elements of the housing bill, we really support the housing permit reform um, provisions. So, and they're it's largely based on H511. We feel like it's a very appropriate balance between um, allowing housing where it needs to go. There is gonna be housing development pressure. Housing's gonna get built. Where do we want it to be? Let's create more space for them in the places that we want housing to be. And I feel like these are um, kind of incremental, um, thoughtful approaches to doing that. And this picture actually, so one of the provisions that you heard Ellen talk about was um, saying that a municipal permit can't expire before the end of two years. This is an example of a project that had gotten caught up in that. It's in the village center of Morrisville, or it's called village center apartment in Morrisville, and it takes a while to pull together all the funding and get through all the permitting. It can take two years for a project to come together, but sometimes there are delays. This one got delayed and they had to go back through the municipal process again, and there was no real public benefit to doing that. Um, so that's an example of why we think that, that we think that's important. Um, when we did the housing <laughs> revenue bond, we were determined to also take a hard look at some policy issues that would outlive the actual creation of the of the units and tried to, and we were really happy to support the work that Chris and his team have done around the zoning for great neighborhoods, um, um, working with communities, piloting some of these things, and that's ultimately led to the um, bylaw modernization grants and um, S two twenty six includes the official authorization for that. You might recall that last year I came in and asked when you were looking at this in the other bill, I asked you to include the word affordable to make sure that um, when communities are doing that and planning on it, they don't do it. They do it in a way that makes sure that affordable housing remains in that mix. Um, and so thank you for doing that. And the version that came over for the Senate has that language as well. Wastewater connection permits, we're supportive of that. If there's a duplication that's not necessary, um, let's, let's not do that anymore. <laughs> Um, there's, yeah, the, the duplication can be, uh, we can remove the local review and leave it to the experts of the state. That's another alternative to the streamlining of wastewater connection permits. I'm a little uneasy of having the, um, by removing the experts, the state I see. agency, yeah. as opposed to having it done at the local level. Do you have a comment on that? I don't have a comment on that. I would say that it would be best to not do it twice if it's not if it's not really leading to a public benefit. Thank you. Um, there's some tweaks to the ADU parking requirements which we support, and then also, and you've heard us mention the designation programs over and over again. They're such an important tool, but I know that the department would like a chance to really take a look at that and see if they need updating or revising or improving. And we would certainly support adding that to 226 if you have the opportunity. And then we can go to the next slide. And I think it might be the last. Yeah. So that's how to get a hold of me if you have any questions. And then um, I wanted to finish with this picture. It's a project that we 
funded um, and it illustrates the point um, and the value of raising the caps uh, um, in the communities. That's one of the H511 provisions and one of the frontier. This, this is proposed to be 24 units and that's purposely to stay under the cap. And if, um, if the cap was raised for this community, you could get a handful more of, um, of housing there. It's a good location. It's in a neighborhood development area. There's been a lot of community input. Um, so it seems a shame not to be able to have added a few more homes there. It's not easy. <laughs> it's really not easy to site and permit an affordable housing or any housing development. So if there's a general agreement that this place makes sense, let's add, let's get a few more homes out of it. And I think raising that cap will, will have that, um, will have that effect. Tim, may I ask one question? Um, yes. Thank you. And maybe this is something more for the, the state, but I'm, uh, those communities with local zoning and that are interested in this at least have the capacity to be able to look at the site design to ensure that that new development, housing development mm -hmm. in particular, matches kind of that um, the, the the community um, landscape or or um, aesthetics, if you may, if I may, at least doesn't conflict with you know that, and and that helps tourism, it helps the economy, helps that vibrancy. For those communities that don't have that, and you remove Act 250, I, I, I'm just concerned as to whether, how do we maintain that kind of sense of place that our rural communities would want to maintain so that, that, that they don't become potential eyesores, but that become integrated into that, the, um, that viewscape of, the, of those communities. Yeah, well, I... Maybe this isn't what you're asking me, but I'm not suggesting that Act 250, that housing shouldn't have to go through Act 250 at all. I think that it makes sense in those areas where there is a local process or has gone through the designation program um, and the community has embedded um, review processes, that that's where it makes sense. But I wouldn't say housing shouldn't have to go through Act 250 at all. Thank you. If I could add, I'm sorry, it's a voluntary program. So the community has to go through the process. So it's not, we're not making a blanket change that affects all communities. They have to both seek the designation, meet all of the requirements. They have to have local regulations. Um, so I think I think the way it's designed addresses your concern. Great. Thank you. I think you might hear for some communities that they feel like the state asked too much of them before they can go through the de be designated, but that's, that's a policy Thank you. balancing question. Thank you for your testimony. That will go to Katie. Kind of looking to see a possum. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't. Yeah. You got to hang out in here a lot more often. <laughs> I've been here years over there. and only seen one. <laughs> Chris and Jacob want to go. I, well, I feel like you have a lot more of that background. So, that's yeah, it's, it's, I guess I can I can jump back. Uh, well, we have we actually have another. We have to get into another agenda okay. item. So I was going to wrap with you and have Chris and Jacob come back. We're not finished with this. I was not expecting all of these presentations to go as long as they did. It's great. We had lots of good questions, great presentations. But um, we this is this is chapter one uh, of uh, exploring the housing. So you can just okay. say you love the bill. Yeah. Down, drop well, the this, mic. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, well, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Again, my name is Katie Gallagher, and I direct the Sustainable Communities Program with Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, and as you know, we are a statewide environmental organization, and our Sustainable Communities Program focuses on primarily promoting smart growth and preventing sprawl. Um, so we are very interested in this bill because, of course, we want to see more housing in those right locations in our downtowns and villages where people can have more transportation options. We can take development pressures off of outlying areas. Um, you know, this was mentioned, I think, by, by some um, witnesses already. This is an equity issue. It's an economic development issue quality of life, climate, you name it, this is housing affects all of these things. Um, and we were very grateful to be able to work with our partners um, or, or this this fall to help to craft and refine H511, thanks to Representative Bongards and James. Um, we really appreciated that process, felt like it was, it was very inclusive and thoughtful. Um, and so 
um, I think that uh, S226 is is a um, great example of uh, a process that, that resulted in a very thoughtful bill. Um, so um, thinking about this, you know, we understand that the housing crisis is a very complex issue. And while we offer our support for the majority of the pr provisions in this bill, I do wanna state up front that VNRC does not believe that regulations are the only or the primary obstacle to housing production. Um, that said, we recognize that regulations and the Act 250 process can be duplicative in, in some cases, especially in towns with sophisticated planning and zoning. As we just um, talked about, this is the case for municipalities that have gone through the process to get a neighborhood uh, development area designation. They, they already have very sophisticated planning and zoning. Um, but we also believe that it's really important that any bill that encourages housing also includes provisions that protects our forests and working lands. Um, you know, we need to address the need for affordable housing, but also the pressure that um, is going to be put and is already being put on our forests and working lands through, as we've talked about again, the incoming um, folks, both coming in from out of state, but also those who are looking for homes here. Um, if they can't find homes in our downtown areas and the places that we want, they're gonna be looking to those places that we don't want housing development. And we know that we are facing a loss of forest land at over 14,000 acres a year. So this is a fairly significant um, issue. So in order to achieve a more balanced smart growth approach to housing development, we suggest moving the Act 250 related provisions in um, S226 into S234, which you're gonna hear more of um, tomorrow. This is an act relating to changes to Act 250, recently passed the Senate um, with much of the same language that's in S226. Um, and again, you'll, you'll hear more from my colleague, Jamie Fidel on S234 tomorrow, I believe. Um, so with that framing and that in mind, I'd like to just highlight a couple of the policies that we support in S226. And again, we, we very broadly support this bill, but we do have a, just a couple um, suggestions for improvement. I wanted to highlight some of those pieces that have more environmental and land use considerations. Um, so I'm gonna go into a bit more detail than the previous witnesses and appreciate all of the helpful context that has already been provided. So hopefully this, this makes sense. Um, but starting with um, in section two, allowing the neighborhood development areas to include the flood hazard and polluvial erosion areas that contain pre-existing development and are suitable for infill development. This section we support because it acknowledges that most of our historic centers, as we know, were already built along rivers. Um, and this has resulted in an obstacle for those municipalities that are looking um, to, to achieve a neighborhood designation area. So this provision helps to bring the NDA program in line with the Agency of Natural Resources guidance that infill development in these areas can be uh, environmentally responsible if done properly. So we feel that this is a, um, a reasonable approach that, that also has the benefit of um, requiring these local bylaws to also address river corridor protection outside of that small geographic area of the NDA itself. So we have um, up and downstream protections from this, from this provision. Um, in section 2C6, this is allowing municipalities to apply for an NDA um, prior to having municipal sewer or alternative wastewater systems. Um, Chris and Jacob were touched on this uh, earlier, but this provision supports the ability of municipalities to move forward with a community sewer uh, or decentralized wastewater system um, or priority housing projects. Who are you in the building? I'm sorry, section page five. Page five. Thank you. I have a page number. Two, section two C Top of the page. six. But that, that language has been struck. Well, it's proposed to be struck in this to be struck. in this bill. Yeah. Okay. Um and you're saying you're in support of that, of the 
it is it is something I, that we I would say don't are not strongly in support of, but something that we are not opposing because we understand the benefit and the and the trade off there. That ultimately these projects would still require a state water and wastewater permit, um, and um, and when we're talking about priority housing project as as a relatively dense development, it's going to need um, some wastewater capacity. So it's not something that that we're worried about contributing to sprawl, for example, with individual systems. Um, moving down to section five, this is the proposed increase of the, the um, high population cap for the priority housing projects. Um, that would increase the number of these priority housing projects exempt, exempt from Act 250. Um, this would allow particularly smaller towns to build affordable housing with greater density. So we do support this provision. However, we do recommend that the increase sunsets after the ARPA funds are required to be expended in order to collect some data and feedback and, and actually evaluate the impacts of this change. Um, there is a um, an assessment of the state designation programs that we support that is being considered this session that's floating around at the moment, but this evaluation of that change to the population caps could potentially be a part of, <clears throat> of that assessment. Um, in section 12, the municipal bylaw modernization grants, uh, we strongly support this section. They're a very important incentive-based mechanism uh, to support municipalities' efforts to ensure that their bylaws support the housing density and accessibility that we're looking for. Um, and, and I just want to note that we support the appropriation of $650,000 that is in addition to the funding for the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund. It was, um, I was unclear in the language whether that money was being taken from the fund, but I, it's just can't state how important it is that we are adequately funding planning in general and the modernization grants should, should be funded on top of that. Um, and then in section 14, the downtown and village center tax credit program. This is a really critical high demand source of financial support for the creation of housing units and adaptive reuse in our historic centers. So we support expanding eligibility to include the neighborhood. Does it, um, does it well, neighborhood, <laughs> Not designation. Development. 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 Right. Thank you. Wow. Ooh, areas. Um, uh, because it would provide greater access to these opportunities while continuing again to prioritize our, our smart growth areas. Um, so we we support funding for the program being um, increased along with any eligibility expansion to not again dilute that existing funding pool. So we we're pleased to see the Senate support for this program as well. Um, so I think I will, I will leave it there. And again, there's several other provisions in this bill that that further support housing creation. And I did not mention them, but we are in support of, of many of the other pieces and policies in this bill. Um, feel like it's a very positive step forward to address our, our housing crisis. Um, but in closing, I would also just reiterate that we feel it's very important to pair housing development policies with forest protections, which you'll hear more about in detail tomorrow. So we'd be happy to provide any further testimony um, and happy to answer any questions if, if there are time, if there is time. Members have quick questions. Uh, Representative Dolan. There's a strong interest to try to streamline the permitting of water and wastewater. And I think what's in this bill is eliminating state oversight and having the municipal um, do you have a, uh, a perspective as to how we should best streamline that? I do not have a perspective on that. Um, if I would say John Grobman would be, might have more, uh, more insight on that particular provision. Okay, thank you. And if you could file your comments. Yes, I'm sorry, and I, I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Um, do we have Ellen coming in? 